Check one, two. Testing one, two, three, four. Hey, hey, check, check, one, two. I've been with Pennsylvania Hospital's Joan Cornell Cancer Center since 1999, so it's been a while, and there have been some progress, although there's a lot we don't know about nutrition. And even if you don't have breast cancer, a lot of the information still applies um, because a lot of it is general um, cancer survivorship. So the first is that if you're in the midst of treatment, get through your treatment with minimal starts and stops. So make sure you're able to eat through it, managing side effects. Um, if you have nausea, take the medication that might be appropriate for that. Sometimes ginger helps people with nausea management, um, et cetera. Try not to lose a lot of weight during that area. And this is an area of confusion for a lot of people. They say, well, I've been trying to lose weight my whole life. Why can't I jump on this as an opportunity to lose weight? The problem with a lot of weight loss during cancer treatment is that it might further suppress your immune system and come from your muscle mass, which is going to cause more weakness. And also, it's going to probably um, result in you not burning off enough calories if you're losing muscle mass. So try not to lose weight. If any of you are on treatment for breast cancer, they generally, those therapies do not diminish appetite. If you were vigorously exercising and eating very healthy and happened to lose a pound or so um, here and there, that would not be a problem. But it's that unintentional weight loss because you can't eat. That's the problem. It's never good when you can't eat, irregardless of how you feel about your body weight. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we're just starting with in case people are undergoing treatment. Mm -hmm. And there are our handouts out on that side if you're interested. Okay. Some of the side effects, I don't think I'm going to really go through them right now because it sounds like the interest is really more moving beyond that. So these are the recommendations, food, nutrition, physical activity, and prevention guidelines from the American Institute for Cancer Research. This is a phenomenal organization that supports research for nutrition and physical activity. So if you're really looking for more of the research, um, <clears throat> they have them all on their website, www.aicr, and that's listed in your packet a little bit further on. I'll point that out when we get there. This is in here? Yes, it is. They also have e-recipes, and it's very usable information. So just to go through the guidelines, be as lean as possible without being underweight. Again, that key. Don't be underweight. Be physically active. I can't tell you how much evidence now is coming out about physical activity and how it supports the immune system, how it supports your mental health, how it supports weight management and bone density. And I am going to talk a little bit about that. Limit your intake of sugary drinks because that is a um, unnecessary, unhelpful calorie load. Anything you do once in a while is okay. So you can stay. What about the uh, you know, sh no sugar drinks? Yes, they would be okay, you know, depending on how you feel about taking in sugar substitutes. So that's, you know. What about those vitamin 101 and the, uh, the, uh, what's the other thing? What's the different There are so many of them. Some are high calories. Some that I've looked at for the vitamin load, it really wasn't substantial at all. So if you're looking for something other than water because you just can't handle water right now, I think they're a good option. But if you're really looking at them to increase your vitamin intake, I'm not sure they're going to be providing you with much, except for maybe making your wallet a little bit thinner. So do be cautious of that. It's a big market. It's a very big market right now. Um, eat mostly foods of plant origin, and I'm going to be focusing a lot on that and why. Limit your intake of red meat and avoid processed meats, such as lunch meats. Limit alcohol, alcoholic drinks. Limit consumption of salt and avoid moldy grains and legumes. That really applies to maybe areas where they don't have good storage or transportation. Yay, you found us. There are handouts over on the side, please. This is nutrition. 
Um, please take, there's two handouts. There's the uh, PowerPoint as well as an article on soy, since that's always a question I get. So I'm going to just back up one slide, because what I'm doing here is reviewing the American Institute for Cancer Research guidelines for cancer survivorship and prevention. I'll let you just read it a little bit as we um, keep on going. So we're going to be talking about managing body weight, physical activity, avoidance of sugary substances, particularly drinks, um, and eating mostly a plant-based food. Limiting red meat and processed meats, um, drinking alcohol minimally if at all. Aim to get your needs through uh, nutritional needs through diet alone. It's about the whole food and not the pills. It's about the whole food and not the pills. And if you didn't hear the first time, it's about the whole food and not the pills. <laughs> And the reason is that there really are more and more studies now coming out saying that more pills may be um, not only not helpful, but harmful. Cancer survivors. Yeah, some of that really applies to maybe other countries uh, where they don't turn it over well enough. But if... Um, if you have whole grains in your house, try to turn them over. Keep them in an airtight container so that they're not exposed to a lot of moisture. Yeah. Um, and I do like the purchase of bulk grains because then you can buy what you need. Like if you were interested in making a dish for quinoa, but you know you probably won't use it too much, just go to the bulk foods area. This is nutrition. I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go to the, this is the woman, yes. Go to the ladies' room and go through to the other side. And it's, it's There's right handouts there. right over there, Deidre. I don't see her. So for cancer survivors, this says prevention guidelines. The same guidelines apply for cancer survivorship. Hello, come on in. And there are handouts over in the corner. So I love this one. East, west, north, mouth. Watch the diet go south. Supersize your thighs. So we really do have to watch out for marketing. Um, there are so many billboards around, and there are so many advertisements when it comes to television. And some of, they have, some of them have wonderful pictures of whole grains. But remember, marketing is marketing. Okay, maintaining a body weight is extremely important. Um, it increases your chance for a healthy, long life. And also, it reduces your risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, and a stroke. Do you know the number one cause of death for women who are breast cancer survivors is heart attack, heart disease. Um, a higher body weight is also associated with circulating estrogen, Estrogen production in postmenopausal women occurs in the fat cells, and higher body fat increases your risk. So body weight by far is important. And I'm not just saying for breast. I am saying for a lot of the gynecological cancers as well <clears throat> as many other cancers. So maintaining a healthy body weight. Now, there are concerns because... The catch-22 is sometimes going through the treatment for breast cancer results in weight gain. If it isn't bad enough to be diagnosed with breast cancer and then you're going to gain weight, what are you kidding me? Um, a lot of people, you know, thought, oh, I'll get chemotherapy and the silver lining will be that I'll lose my appetite and lose weight. Well, we don't really know why, but I can tell you some reasons potentially why. Women gain about 5 to 14 pounds through the course of treatment. The research has been done with no substantial intake change in intake calorically. However, the nausea, cre um, the fatigue creates significant um, decreases in physical activity. So therein might be the key. Also, for people who do not even change their intake or change their weight, there are body composition changes. So there is a loss of lean muscle mass 
and an increase in body fat at a 10 times higher rate, um, accelerated by 10 times than the normal aging process. So it's really important to stay physically active and kind of mind your diet and portion sizes. There are handouts right over there. So if you don't know what your body mass index is, you might want to, um, oh, I just wanted to back up a second. For the reason about weight gain, did anyone go to the Living Beyond Breast Cancer talk October 1st or 2nd? So the person who does this research, her name is Wendy DeMarc Winifred, and she's fabulous. She has done a lot of studies on the body composition changes. Um, so she is the one that I follow. If you don't know your body mass index, this is a good tool when you're looking at height versus weight. Where it does not, um, there are handouts over on the side. Where it doesn't help is if you were uh, an athlete because muscle mass weighs more than body fat. So if you put a football player on a scale, um, he's going to have a very high body weight. And this BMI chart might show him to be morbidly obese where if you look at them, you can see it's muscle. Um, so that's where it kind of falls out. However, um, there was a review with 6,400 breast cancer patients, and they looked at their body mass index over 14 years. And the results was that there is an association between body weight and recurrence of breast cancer with a decreased survival. So um, if you're overweight, you can increase your recurrence. If you're obe obese, you definitely increase your recurrence by twice as much as that, and survival. The, now, the association doesn't necessarily show cause and effect, but there is an association. I have a chart I'll pass around, and you can um, follow it on one scale down for your height and the other across for your weight to find out what your BMI is. And on the second page, it shows you where you fall, whether you're underweight, healthy weight, um, considered overweight, or obese. But there are also tools online um, where you can just plug in your height and weight, and it'll do it for you. So feel free to look at that. Hello. There are handouts on the side, I know. So check out those tools. Um, and again, it's not a perfect tool if you're a muscular individual. Um, you want to stay within 20 to 25 for a BMI. That being said, if you come out to be 32, what do you do? Do you jump up, you know, out the window? No, you just try to get to 30 and pump up your physical activity and start making some positive changes. So even a 10% weight loss is going to be helpful for you. How to lose the weight. Okay. So I've actually had this discussion um, with someone, and there was a study of 48 breast cancer survivors, and they were put in one of four groups, a control group, a Weight Watchers group, um, a group that met with a dietitian weekly and then biweekly, and then a combination of Weight Watchers and specialized nutrition counseling with a registered dietitian. And it showed that the latter two, latter two had the most weight loss. Um, with the last one, group number four, the comprehensive evaluation with the registered dietitian, yet the weekly follow-ups with Weight Watchers. Um, that helps with the stick with itness, so to speak, because you've got the group support. That group number four, they lost 21 pounds in this period of time, and they also had um, a percentage of body fat loss as well. So that might be a very reasonable way to go about it. For this group being cancer survivors or at high risk, I would encourage you to look for a registered dietitian who is a CSO, and that stands for Certified Specialist in Oncology. And that's, I think it's right on my handouts after the name. And that just tells you that that person has specific training. I've been working in oncology for 12 years, uh, and the person, before they can sit for this test, has to be working in oncology or with um, cancer patients and study really um, diligently. So weight management's important. 
we'll talk about portion sizes. But if weight is an issue for you, I want, to I want to encourage you to consider using one of these online tools that help you crunch numbers. Certainly, you can do it by hand. You can keep a little food journal. There are some that are in the bookstores, little journals that you write, calculate calories. But these websites actually will do some of it for you. Yes. Everything but the pictures is in your handout. I didn't think you needed the pictures. So um, do look at some of these online tools. And which one you choose is really the one that you feel is going to be user-friendly for you. Um, Fitday.com, My Daily Plate, those are ones I'm familiar with. Yes? Um, I have an app on my phone. Okay. It's called um, My Net Diary. My Net Diary. And Oh, cool. Okay, that's great. Yes. My Net Diary. It's an app. Okay, thanks for sharing. That's great. Um, but anyway, you can make it easier for you if you can't read this. I have metal fillings in my teeth. My refrigerator magnets keep pulling me into the kitchen. That's why I can't lose weight. Um, so I know it's not as easy as it might sound. And it takes a lot of diligence and stick with itness and um, commitment on your part. And a friend of mine gave me another uh, for my fitness app. Not that I've done it yet, but she's done it. <laughs> Okay. My Fitness Pal. My Fitness Pal. P A L? My Fitness Pal. It's not just about exercise. Okay. But you do want that dual approach of what you eat and how physically active you are. Your exercise program, again, is as important. I am not an exercise guru, but I will tell you the benefits of exercise are numerous. And um, Penn actually has a wonderful exercise physiologist working with them, Katie Schmitz, who did the PAL study. And there she showed that weight training decreases the likelihood of lymphedema flare-ups or its onset. So it's safe for women with breast cancer um, who've had lymph node dissections that are concerned about lymphedema. It also can help you prevent that weight gain, help you moderate estrogen and insulin levels, um, even walking. So think of the activities of daily living are as important as a formal exercise program. And what I mean by that is walking to the post office, walking to the mailbox, walking to the corner store, instead of always getting in our car and driving somewhere. If you can seize an opportunity to fit in a walk with a friend, do that <clears throat> instead of maybe going to a coffee house and getting a scone. And it also increases your natural killer cells, which is also a very good thing, and enhances your immune system. So here are some of the benefits of physical activity. And if we found this in a pill, that would be one, one great pill that we would all be looking for. But because it takes effort every day, day in, day out, it's harder to get around to it. <clears throat> Always check with your doctor as well. So we know that there are protective effects. It can decrease recurrence and increase survivorship. If I wanted a rapid heartbeat to get all hot, I, all I need to do is wait for my menopause symptoms. <clears throat> OK, so vitamin D we're going to talk about a little bit, because there have been some observational studies that show that decreased levels of vitamin D are associated with increased risk for breast cancer and recurrence. Now, uh, Roman Schlebowski is uh, one of the principal investigators for the WINS trial, or Women's Health Initiative, excuse me. And he does not recommend routine testing or doesn't feel that we have enough evidence to suggest routine testing, monitoring, and supplementation. But I will tell you that if you suffer from or have a family history of osteoporosis, if you're on any of the medications that can also decrease your bone density, if you are struggling with fibromyalgia, 
Those at times have been really vitamin D deficiencies confused as fibromyalgia. It does not hurt to get your level checked. And why not get it checked? <clears throat> so you can ask your physician to check a 25-hydroxy-D. And um, the levels would be about 32 or higher. Many people are vitamin D deficient. Now, I don't encourage you to go to the store and just start supplementing on your own. I think you really should know where your level is before you start supplementing. What was the name you checked for? 25. 25-hydroxy-D. And it is on the bottom of this slide here, vitamin D new research. Um, now, it's going to change seasonally. It changes by where you live. It changes by your body weight. It changes African-American people are more vitamin D deficient. More people are vitamin D deficient overall. And it is a fairly simple fix as long as you know what your level is. Certainly, vitamin D and calcium are extremely important. The vitamin D RDA has just been increased to 600 IU. It used to be 400 IU. Um, and you can take some calcium vitamin D pills supplements, 600. So if you were to take a pill now, most, most of them, calcium and vitamin D, have 200 IUs, and then you should take two a day, so that would get you to 400 IUs, and then I'll review the food forms. You just said 600. Yes, but we're combining what you might take through a vitamin pill uh, okay. and what you might take, what you might get food-wise. And don't forget about sun exposure. Excuse me. The safe upper limit's about 4,000. So um, you can take, you can take um, two calcium supplements. It's best to calcium with vitamin D. It's best to separate them. Don't take them with iron if you have to take iron. Don't take iron if you don't have to take it. Um, calcium citrate is not constipating or not as constipating. However, the calcium carbonate is a little bit more effective and less expensive. So if you don't have a problem with the calcium carbonate, then try that one. It can be constipating, yes. If you have loose bowels, get on a calcium supplement. Um, and then there are also, uh, there is the Viactive Chew, and there are a couple store brands of that. So it's like a little caramel or chocolate chew. Um, I, I know there are a couple of companies or gen, general stores that have store brands, and they're pretty good as well. Are the so, ones you mentioned, caltrate, et cetera, are they the calcium carbonate? Or are they I don't remember offhand. I have to look. I don't, I don't remember offhand. Yeah, I know. Uh, my, uh, my active. Uh, no, I guess it depends on which one you buy because the one I have has vitamin D. It's not Viactive, but it's a soft chew. Calcium, vitamin D, my, the one I have is from Trader Joe's. There are other ones at so Walmart. Viactive itself makes it. But okay, so Viactive it makes it with D. It says Viactive plus D. Yes. At any time. With the meal or not. Right. Where the calcium carbonate it's better to take it one to three hours after a meal. So you have to play around with timing a little bit more with the calcium carbonate. The calcium citrate, no, the D, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. In fact, D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and um, it might be helpful to take it with a little bit of something like a meal. So, okay, so other sources of calcium and vitamin D. Did you need a handout? Okay, other sources of calcium and vitamin D, certainly salmon. It has bones in it. If you buy it in the can, um, they're very soft bones. Um, your greens, dried fruit, blackstrap molasses has some calcium, flavoring in shoe fly pie. Um, you can buy tofu and other soy products. We'll talk about the soy issue that are calcium fortified as well. Tempeh, broccoli, or white beans. Vitamin D, you only need about 10 minutes of sunlight. And part of the issue with vitamin D is that we're all lathering up with sunscreen, basically, in our lotions. Um, so you don't need that much sunlight. And um, 
wild salmon has a much higher vitamin D level than farm-raised salmon. And then the fattier fish, whole grains, um, milk is fortified with vitamin D. So calcium, vitamin D, very important. Following a low-fat diet also may decrease the risk for reoccurrence. And the issue with um, the fat also, I think, crosses over into the heart disease area as well and many other areas. Um, this is a little controversial. And the one study that was looked at, the WINS trial, uh, Women's Intervention and Nutrition Study, found that there really was a difference between estrogen receptor negative, um, the estrogen receptor negative group. They had a 42% lower risk of recurrence on a low-fat diet than the estrogen receptor positive. We can't really explain that. The estrogen receptor positive only had a 13% um, decrease in recurrence where the ER negative had a 42%. Can't explain it, whether it was because of the other treatments that the ER positive are on, or because the length of time wasn't long enough. Can't exactly explain it. So actually, these studies were a little disappointing in that it was only a 24% decreased risk of recurrence. However, generally, it's going to be a diet that's higher in fruits and vegetables which gives you a lot of other cancer-fighting properties. So we'll talk about the meat itself. I do encourage you to try to incorporate more plant-based food as you can. Um, do watch cooking temperatures. I know we're going into the fall, but <clears throat> post-summer time. Try not to grill and char your meats or use some surface um, barriers like foil on your grill. Even marinades or herb rubs help to give a barrier to the meat itself because it's the fats that drip down on the charcoals and splash up that cause the creation of the heterocyc heterocyclic amines that are carcinogens. We know that there really are no health benefits of processed meats. It does give you a lot of salt and many more, um, much more fat than the fresh product. I have a question. Yes. Uh, the grill. Yes. You know, um, with gas grills, yes, it's still the same. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah, because it's still that splashing up of the fat, splashing okay. up and hitting. But so if you don't get it charred, let's say it's okay? Less charred. Less, but better than not charred. Yes, less charred, turning it more often so it's less charred, maybe starting the cooking process in a microwave. So you have it exposed to the grill a little less, a little shorter period of time might be helpful. Again, marinating or trying an herb rub that gives a little barrier. Yes? You're talking about the open grill as opposed to something like the Foreman grill, which is just a heated element. The Foreman grill, I don't believe, has the same result. But I'm kind of saying that as a gut answer and not an informed decision. <laughs> So um, that's what I would say. Um, so we go back to the portion size of meat. You might not be ready to become a vegetarian. I think that's an extremely personal decision. But if you aren't ready, then try to look at the portion size and keep it to the three ounce rule, which is the size of a deck of cards or about the size of my palm, three ounces. And then try to have it only once a day instead of base two meals uh, around the meat to so have it less often with an increase in your fishes that might have more omega-3 fatty acids in them. Which takes me to, um, I don't know why my, I have arrows on my handout, but up here it's showing as quotation marks. Um, I would like to see that your protein forms are higher in the omega-3 fatty acids and the omega-9s, which are your olive oils. Well, those are oils, not proteins. But um, eat more of the fatty fish and fewer of the meat, saturated meats, saturated fats in the form of dairy, cheese, um, and whole milk products. But I mean that Greek yogurt's not good? The Greek yogurt you can get in a low-fat variety. And it is very high in protein. So I actually like the Greek yogurt. 
The other thing, the difference between the Greek yogurt and the regular yogurt, if you see the flavored yogurts, some of them have four to six equivalents of packets of sugar in them. The Greek yogurt generally does not, and it doesn't have the additives, and it's twice as high in protein. So I do like the use of Greek yogurt. But you say low-fat yogurt is still a problem. <clears throat> no, I think low-fat yogurt is better uh, than whole milk. No-fat yogurt is better than low-fat. So if you're transitioning, I would say start with the low-fat and then try to move to the no-fat. And I will tell you that the no-fat cheeses have not been successful yet. So I don't see that that's a reasonable change to make. Um, there are a few part skim milk um, mozzarella cheeses that are okay. <clears throat> but I would say with cheese, consume it less often because cheese is as high in fat as pepperoni. It's just very high in fat. Yeah, I know. It's a sorry thought, isn't it? I love cheese myself, but... The other thing about um, increasing your intake of omega-3s and omega-9s is that those are the anti-inflammatory foods that help to support your immune system. Somebody asked me about foods to support the immune system. And I hope that um, you can read this chart uh, that is from Dr. Wiles, Dr. Andrew Weil, an integrative medicine physician. This is from his website. So you really want the basis of your diet to be vegetables and fruits with your whole grains, pastas, and legumes being the next layer there. Your healthy fats from olive oils or nuts being the next layer. And then uh, your omega-3 rich fats from um, things like salmon, tuna, mackerel, sardines, herring, two to four times a week. Soy is on here, whole soy foods, edamame, soy nuts, soy milk. Um, actually, mushrooms is listed on here as an immune-enhancing compound, and that is true. <clears throat> um, using a general use of spices and herbs, including, uh, listed here, turmeric. Turmeric is the yellow color that you would get in curry. So there are immune-enhancing properties of this turmeric as well as cancer-fighting properties. Um, and it's actively being studied um, in many different models, animals and people. Um, so if you like curry, look for the turmeric itself, which can be added to things like broth, salad dressing, rice. Um, you could even put it in your tea. It has a very pervasive flavor, I will tell you that. And if you don't like the flavor, it might not be an option for you. <clears throat> but it's not the spicy, spicy of curry. Curry also doesn't have to be spicy. Curry can be very mild. So it really depends on the kind of curry you get because curry is a combination of up to 16 different herbs and spices. And some are very mild. So if you go into a regular grocery store, you'll get one kind of curry. That's very mild. If you go into an Indian grocery store, you'll see a waffle of curries, and they will vary from mild to hot. They do say with the turmeric, you want to put a little bit of pepper in it to get more out of it. So now, I talked about, um, and I'm going to be talking about fruits and vegetables, but for full disclosure, I do need to tell you that there was a study called the Women's Health the Eating and Living Study of 3,000 women, and they conser um, consume three servings of fruits, five servings of vegetables, 20% fat calories, and 30 grams of fiber. We are really excited about this. The bottom line on the study, no difference in outcomes, no weight change. That was very disappointing. Um, I'm still supporting it, though. Because maybe the study wasn't long enough. It was very well done, 3,000 people. So we can't exactly explain why that is. But I still like to gear you towards um, the fruits and vegetables have a lot of other properties in them. They also are lower in calories, higher in fiber, so they help with weight management. And there really are other beneficial reasons as well. 
Now, there was another breakout of that study that showed eating five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day, along with 30 minutes of physical activity, actually reduced the risk of death, death after early stage breast cancer by 44%. So this is where I don't like to see you get discouraged by all this conflicting information. And if you know the internet, you know that there you can go crazy because of all the conflicting information. One site tells you one thing, another site tells you another thing. If you're trying to adopt healthy lifestyle changes and it's stressing you out so much, that is immune suppressing. So you know, try to kind of use your common sense, look at the basis of the um, who supported the website, and, and, you know, seek out assistance and someone like myself to break it out for you. Some of these questions you might have, for every person you ask, you'll get a different answer. That's the other thing. And probably a lot of it is that it, this is a work in progress. So one thing I like to encourage you to eat is flaxseed. So this is a picture of flaxseed compared to the size of a quarter. So flaxseed is, is hard as a poppy seed, but looks like a sesame seed, if you haven't seen it. And there was a small study of um, 32 women who ate a flaxseed muffin. <clears throat> Actually, 13 ate the muffin without flaxseed. 19 ate it with the flaxseed. And um, the study looked at uh, the tissue after at breast biopsy, both at the beginning and then um, by surgery time. And they showed favorable um, cell characteristics. So the cancer cells behaved better. Um, there was less cell division, more cell death, and no changes in the estrogen and progesterone um, receptors. And the reason I say that is because many people get off the flaxseed because there is a phytoestrogen in it, a plant estrogen. I think you can safely consume one to three, serve, one to three tablespoons of flaxseed a day. Depending on your bowels, it is a laxative, so you might want to start low, gradually increase, and it also gives you some omega-3 fatty acids and lignans in there, which have cancer-fighting properties as well. Here's the other thing. The black seed is the poppy seed, the round black. Um, so this is a little more oval, and you do have to grind it. So if you consume it whole, it will go in one end and out the other in the same form that it went in. And it has to be ground. One to three tablespoons. Start out at one, maybe sprinkle it a little bit on cereal, put a little bit on yogurt with fruit. Sprinkle it on salad. It gives a nice nutty characteristic to salad. You can put it on vegetables. Yeah. Yes, you can buy. Just keep it in the refrigerator. <clears throat> Buying it ground, it's called flax meal. Ground flaxed meal. And it does have a shorter shelf life, so you need to refrigerate it. Or you can use it, you can buy the seed and grind it yourself and put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. Um, how long is it? Turn it over? I don't know an answer for that, but I would say approximately six months. One to three tablespoons. That would be of the meal. Yeah, because you don't want to consume the seed is it's not going to be helpful for you, and it might be irritating to your GI tract. And I do not, cons do not encourage you to consume the oils because you're not getting the beneficial compounds in them. Mm -hmm. Yes? I don't like it. I don't recommend it um, because you're going to be taking out some of the beneficial compounds of the whole seed itself. One in particular is called lignans. And even if it says it has lignans in it, the um, people who kind of look at products on whether they contain what they say they contain, they're not finding the lignans. So it hasn't really been a standardized process yet. So I don't encourage the flax oil. You cannot cook with flax oil either. It has a very low smoke point. 
And that smoking is kind of like a carcinogen. You don't want your oils to be so smoky. Yes? They might have some, but it would be kind of the same thing. I don't think you're getting the whole... I don't think you're getting the whole thing. What yeah. about for those who had I encourage you to take flax. Yes, I've heard it be beneficial for even because there are some anti-inflammatory processes. I know some people feel it helps their arthritis. Now that is anecdotal, but I also have heard that it helps with uh, moisture in your eyes if you happen to be suffering from dry eyes. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to try it. So I, you do have a slide on some of the other things to do with it. You can blend it in a smoothie or into salad dressing um, or into pesto. <clears throat> you said the flaxseed is good for the moisture in the eye? That's what I've heard. And I heard that actually from an optometrist. I haven't read the study myself, though. <clears throat> okay, so fruits and vegetables, I encourage you to try to eat 7 to 10 servings a day. Uh, some people say, oh, my goodness, I'll be eating fruits and vegetables all day long. But a serving size is very small. A fruit serving size is a half of a cup, which is about the size of a half of a baseball. Um, so that is not that much. The romaine lettuce that you got today <clears throat> was probably a cup and a half of lettuce. So just to put it in perspective... An orange, if it's a large orange, that might be two servings, or if it's a medium orange, that would be one serving. So it really depends. Uh, most servings that you get in a, gross, in a restaurant are going to be closer to a cup, if not more. So um, include your cruciferous vegetables for many reasons. So cruciferous vegetables, they're like the new superfood, and they are... Vegetables that have leaves crossed on the bottom. Crucifer stands for cross. <clears throat> Brussels sprouts, bok choy, cabbage, including kale and collards. Broccoli as well. So definitely consume them minimally twice a week, if not four times a week, if not daily. They have a compound in there called sulfurophane which actually is one of the reasons why people don't like them, because they smell and produce gas. Um, they have indoles in them, which also may stimulate an enzyme that deactivates susceptible hormone-related cancers. Um, they're very rich in the carotenoids. This is, this is fruits and vegetables overall, which may help to decrease cancer risk and recurrence. Um, and they have many other protective properties. So fruits and vegetables have compounds in them called phytochemicals. <clears throat> phytochemicals. And let's see. I thought I had a list. Phytochemicals are in the plant to protect the plant, but in the end they protect you. Now, I don't remember all the names of the phytochemicals. There are hundreds, thousands of them. But these are some that you've heard of recently. Resveratrol. Um, lycopene, lutein would be another one, um, quercetin. So those are the names and these are the products. I'm going to go back again. So think serving size. Don't be um, alarmed by that 7 to 10 servings. A cup of raw vegetables is considered a serving or a half a cup of cooked. A small can of tomato juice is considered a serving <clears throat> or... Dried fruit, unfortunately, takes out all the fluids, so it's a very small serving, two tablespoons. So don't eat a bag of raisins if it's a 12-pound bag. You really only want to get those little, little bags. Think color and think season. Varying it by season and color also helps you vary the pesticides that are used and their phytochemical um, components. So definitely think color. If you're creating a salad, think, what am I going to put that's green on the bottom? Then try to find something white and something red and something orange. Really try to create and develop your grocery cart on color. You're going to go a long way. You don't need a chemistry class. You don't need to study the background of phytochemicals. Think color and frequency. <clears throat> yes? Sweet, Sweet potatoes are very rich. And the carotenoids. Yeah, uh, no. 
There is, we're going to be talking about the phytoestrogen issue. <clears throat> okay, so some people say, oh, do I have to buy all my produce organic? If you can afford it, I say, okay, but it's very expensive. So keep your eye open. Local <clears throat> is best. Local organic is excellent. If you find organic in conventional side by side and they cost the same, then go with the organic. But if you find the organic to be twice as much as the conventional, by far the benefits of eating the plant, whether it be organically grown or conventionally grown, far outweighs the risk. So if you haven't seen the listing by the environmental working group called the Dirty Dozen. <clears throat> Here's a listing here and the website up on top here, ewg.org. So there are 12 that ha um, items that have been identified to hold on to their pesticide content after they've been washed before you consume them that you might want to consider buying organic if you have the option. Peaches, apples, bell peppers, celery, nectarines, strawberries, cherries, kale, lettuce, imported grapes, carrots, and pears. There are 15 listed that end up having a very low pesticide content, and I'm not going to read this to you. <clears throat> but I still even encourage you, again, conventionally or, or organically, eat your produce if you can find locally grown, that's even better. Not all local growers can advertise organic because of the process. It takes very a long time and it's expensive for a small farm. So they might be raising it organic, but you won't know because they can't promote it that way. Can I ask a question about the organic produce? Oh, yes. Okay, so hmm, on that line, fresh... Frozen, they're both excellent. Frozen is a great backup plan. So I say keep on using the greens, keep on using the greens. Well, a chunk of collards takes up half of your bottom shelf. <laughs> it really does. And if you don't think you're going to go through it quickly, have a bag of chopped collards or kale in the freezer. The freezing process has really improved. So um, if produce is going to be frozen, it's picked at its height, height of ripeness and its flash frozen, which minimizes nutrient loss. So actually, frozen orange juice might have more vitamin C in it than fresh, quote, fresh squeezed orange juice in the grocery store because of the travel time of that orange to get from Florida all the way here, whereas the, the orange juice, the orange has been picked, it's been flash frozen, so the vitamin C was stabilized. Just something to think about. Certainly, fresh, I mean, fresh produce doesn't hold a candle. Um, it's far superior to the frozen as far as quality. So I like the fresh better. <clears throat> Canned is actually improved as well, but you do then have... Um, different texture changes. You do have different, um, certainly a lot of sodium added to it, and you may have lost some of the water-soluble vitamins as well. So I don't really encourage the use of canned, but probably for the most part because of the sodium in it. Now, there are some people that I know cannot chew vegetables, and then I encourage them to use the canned. So, um, and that also might apply if there's anyone in this room who is a survivor of some of the gynecological cancers. If you're having issues with cramping, gas, or obstruction, you might need to go to the can and have them be kind of pureed up um, for them to pass a little easier. But that's a very specific issue. <laughs> so if you can't read this... Um, it's carrot cola, veggie do, Dr. Green pepper... I can't even, rutabaga beer. The nutritionists have gone way too far. <clears throat> so that being said, start paying attention to your liquid calories um, because you can get a lot of calories in uh, a fancy coffee shop drink. I'm going to go through a little more quickly because I want to get to some of the phytoestrogen issues. 
If you're drinking a drink that has 440 calories a day, that could result in a pound weight loss if you eliminated it. <clears throat> um, drink alcohol minimally. The standard actually is a drink a day for women. And the way I've heard it explained, which makes a lot of sense, is you kind of have to look at what your personal history is. If you have a history of alcoholism in your family, then no drinks a day is going to be better for you. But if heart disease is really the primary issue in your family, maybe a drink of red wine a day is, is okay for you. Also, what's the size of your drink? <laughs> um, you know, five ounces of wine is a small glass of wine for some people. Mm. Increasing your intake of fiber kind of goes without saying because it does help um, to bind carcinogens in your gut and keep you regular. It keeps your intestinal tract healthy. Um, and your intestinal tract is a barrier for infection. Um, increase your consumption of complex carbohydrates. So it's these whole grains I really want to get out there. If you haven't experimented with some of the whole grains like quinoa and millet, um, I encourage you to do that. They have great uh, resources in some of the stores like Whole Foods, but there are many others out there. Um, we have a website that we're getting our nutrition blog off that will have more and more recipes using whole grains. That's listed on your resource material. And the American Institute for Cancer Research also has wonderful recipes. Um, the sin about this is that this country uses kale as a plate garnish and millet as bird seed. It's really a shame. Okay, so what I want to get into is this discussion of soy. <clears throat> and we'll just say phytoestrogens overall, to soy or not to soy. This is a big issue that has caused so much confusion. And it all based on a very small study that was conducted, I believe about 10 years, that showed that and I don't even remember the specifics, so I'm kind of scratching the cobwebs, that soy increased cell proliferation. That study has never been replicated, and there is increasingly more evidence that says soy consumption over a lifetime is beneficial. Um, so I don't think you have to avoid soy like the plague. And also, the, the thing is that it reduces your risk through lifetime. Well, unfortunately, many, most of the people in this room are already halfway through your lifetime. I hate to tell you this. So um, you've already missed half of that opportunity, me included. So you, oh, excuse me, you might not get the benefits. If you like it, I would say consume it. If you haven't consumed it before, don't search it out. Um, it's the whole food form that we like to encourage, the whole food form being edamame, tofu, so soy milk. And even places like the American Cancer Society are saying one to three servings a day are safe. A serving size is considered eight ounces of soy milk, four ounces of tofu, a half a cup of edamame or a veggie burger. That might be a soy-based veggie burger. Three servings. three servings, one to three so servings a day. No, I don't think you need to avoid it. It has beneficial compounds, carcinogenic compounds. It's a great way to decrease the saturated fat in your diet because it has none. It has high, it's high in fiber. But if that issue of that word estrogen makes you nervous, then I say don't bother. Because there are so many other foods, it's one part of a huge puzzle, and there are many other foods that are beneficial for you. If you're becoming a vegetarian and you like soy, then I would say you should feel comfortable. And that's why I, um, uh, the handout, if you didn't get it, a two-page handout on soy and breast cancer is over on the side there as well. Yes? It's controversial. You have to go with your comfort level. I know there are physicians that still tell you not to eat it. 
Um, I don't tell people not to eat it. I ask them, do they eat it now? What form do you eat it in? I do tell people to avoid soy supplements like soy protein powders, <clears throat> as well as pills that people might take for hot flashes. Then you're kind of dealing with a more concentrated form. I'm not worried about the plant estrogen in foods like soy, I mean, uh, sweet potatoes or the other legumes. I think that's a non-issue. Um, and again, I do think you can safely, if you like soy, you can safely consume it. <clears throat> but again, if you're not comfortable, don't go there. There are other things, I'm sure, that will give you beneficial compounds um, but do feel free to read that handout. I think that should give you a little bit of an ease. Overall, when I look at all the issues that are beneficial, soy is one of them, but not the whole picture. So um, I, I think that it's kind of time to, to move on beyond the soy issue. But I'm not in your shoes. So you have to make that personal decision. And I support anyone who decides that it's not for them. That's fine. Soy, <clears throat> uh, no, sweet potatoes have a plant estrogen. So there are levels of plant estrogens and in foods, naturally occurring in foods, that are like one one hundredth of the um, strength of the estrogen that we might be thinking of. The concern is, is it adding to your estrogen pool or is it helping to bind to the estrogen receptor sites? That's where this all kind of stemmed, one of the <clears throat> issues. I don't think you have to worry about the, the minute amount in the foods. I would be totally safe, um, comfortable saying that it's safe. So again, American Cancer Society, they're very conservative, and they are saying their guidelines now allow up to three servings of whole soy foods a day. The following foods have absolutely no soy estrogen in them, soy sauce, soy oil, and soy lecithin. So I have people still scouring labels for anything that has that three-letter combination, S-L-Y, in it, and eliminating it, and I don't think you need to do that. <clears throat> Dairy is another issue, and I'm sorry to say we are at about 145, so this 140. This is where I will kind of finish up and point out a few things. So <clears throat> there are some controversies with dairy, and it has to do with the casein versus whey um, in the dairy. Whey, though, which is a portion of the um, dairy itself, is immune enhancing. So I also feel that dairy is safe to consume. Do I think it's necessary? I think you can get along just fine, and you can get other calcium and vitamin D sources without consuming dairy. So it's one of those things as well. If you like it, there are beneficial things in dairy, especially yogurt. Look at the probiotics you get in yogurt. I hate to see you avoid it. Um, there have been books out recently that said that casein, the protein in soy, causes cancer. Unfortunately, I think that some of the information in there is slanted. I think that some good points are being made um, it, a lot of the studies were done in China, and China has a very high rate of hepatitis B, which causes cancer, liver cancer specifically, and they have a very high rate of a parasite that causes cancer. So I think it's hard to evaluate it. Um, that's not the whole picture. So I think trying to get a lower-fat um, dairy product, like including the yogurts, is still important. Yes? Yeah. Now, I think that it's reasonable to go with an organic uh, milk product because of the unknown risk for the hormones and antibiotics uh, and the overuse. So I think that's particularly reasonable. The other reason why I like the organic is that they're ultra-pasteurized, which means they have a longer shelf life, so I don't have to throw it out before I finish the gallon or the quart. Um, I don't think pasteurization kills... Uh, the healthy compounds, I think it kills the par um, bacteria in there. So I would not encourage you to drink raw milk if you're immune suppressed particularly. How about the lactate milk? Oh, yeah, if you're lactose intolerant, I definitely 
say, that go for that. that. It does, yes. So the bottom line is try to think of eating healthy and being physically active as a gift to yourself. This is what you can do. And in the end, you will feel recharged and kind of empowered. If you are looking for assistance, look for a certified specialist in oncology. You can go to eatright.org and put in a zip code if you want to find someone in your area. I'm happy to work with anyone who has an oncologist at Pennsylvania Hospital. And there are three excellent um, CSOs at Penn with Penn Medicine. But it's not temporary. There's no short-term fixes. It's kind of in the long haul. So the last few sides in your handouts give you some wonderful resources, Oncolink being one, and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And I applaud you all. I want to thank you for coming, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. That's great. That's conjugate, uh, conjugated linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is a compound that's in dairy that has been thought to be protective. So that's another reason why I don't think you need to avoid dairy. That was great. You really covered it. You really did a lot. <laughs> Tried to in the time constraints. Hi. I have to ask you, I think it is very good. So for somebody who has a balanced diet and it's not a vitamin D deficiency, do you recommend